In this video, we're going to be working on a Caterpillar C18, also discussing what makes the C18 kind of a weird engine, as well as what to look for and things to check when you have any engine disassembled. Hey guys, Josh with the Depth Tape Channel, and in this video we're going to be working on a C18 in a truck. Now you might notice that this truck seat is a little different than normal, but it's still a truck, I assure you. Maybe not one you'd be driving next to on the freeway, though. So what are we working on? Let me show you. So here we are on top of this truck, quote unquote, and if you haven't guessed it, it's a haul truck, which this is what it looks like. Oh, uh, oops, that's actually not what it looks like. This is what it looks like. So this is a 745 haul truck and it has a C18 in it. And if you're familiar with C18s, they're basically identical to a C15 as far as the block and the head and the fuel system, but they have a bigger bore. They have a 5.7 inch bore instead of a 5.4 inch bore. So I'm in the middle of doing our liner protrusion here. And this is a little different than how you do it on the truck because the procedure is the same. But usually you're not sitting on the engine when doing it on a truck. Unfortunately, in a haul truck, you have nowhere to stand other than this platform over here, which is hard to see, but it's about eight feet off the ground. And uh, so you've literally got several feet between you and the engine, whereas on a truck you're standing up, which makes it a lot easier. I was able to get the first four cylinders by standing on that platform, but the, the rear ones, which are five and six, you, you can't. So here we have the world famous C18 internal engine components. So this is a C18 liner here. And I've done a lot of C15 liners, and let me tell you, this thing is light. It's got to be half the weight of a C15 liner. And you have to remember the block's the same on a C15 or a C18, but the C18 has a 5.7 inch bore, and the C15 has a 5.4 inch bore, so there's going to be a lot less metal on the C18 liners, because they still have to fit in the same hole in the block. Now what's interesting is the liner seals here, you can see, are not O-rings, they're actually a flat half moon type seal similar to like say a c12 or a c13 has but on the c15s they're just big old fat o-rings these are these flat ones and that is due of course because the liner's so much thinner i don't believe the o-rings would even fit so what we have here is main bearings and a rod bearing and we're going to discuss a little bit about engines so rod bearing these are journal bearings so they have an upper and a lower and the lower's on the right, and the upper's on the left. Now, if you notice, the one on the right looks brand new, basically, but the one on the left, well, it's got a, quite a bit of wear and some deep rotational scratches in it from most likely debris. Why does the top get more damage than the bottom? Well, that's because the force is pushing down on a rod bearing. What about main bearings? So main bearings are larger, as you can see. Upper's on the left, bottom's on the right. But as you can see on the main bearings, the bottom one is the one that has pretty much all the damage and wear, and the top has nothing. Why is that? It's the opposite of a rod bearing. That's because the crank is pushing down on the rod or the main bearing, and the force is on the bottom. So that's why on main bearings you'll get wear on the bottoms, and rod bearings you'll typically get wear on the tops. That's pretty universal to engines. That's just not C18s by themselves. We have our thrust bearings here, and as usual, these are the old ones, folks. Pretty much every cat thrust bearing I've ever pulled out of an engine looks like it's identical to the new one. They almost never have a wear on them. Very normal. If they do have wear, the only ones I've seen that have ever worn through have been on ones where there was a transmission problem, but very normal to have no wear on them. Now what we're looking at is a piston. The rings have been removed and this one's been cleaned and all the carbon's been removed off the top. You need to remove the carbon where the rings go and here's our upper ring. I'm trying to show you, there's part numbers and it says up on it. Obviously that needs to face up because these are what they call keystone style rings which means the shape of them expand out during the combustion stroke. We have our upper, our middle, and our lower which is our oil control ring and we have our new ones right here. 
Now, it's very rare for me to be putting new rings on. Generally, I get whole new packs. And I'm trying to clean off the carbon, which is a pain in the butt. And I'm going to be using a ultrasonic parts cleaner, the same one I did a video on. The other ones I was using like a really non-aggressive wire wheel to clean the carbon off. Here's one that has not been cleaned, so you can see the difference. I want to see if the ultrasonic parts cleaner, and I'm using some aviation parts cleaner in it, will clean off the carbon so I don't have to wire wheel them while I do other things. So this is going to be a little experiment. I have not tried this before. So here is our ultrasonic parts cleaner, and I put those rod bearings in there so it would fit because the piston's rather large. Now I must warn you, before I turn this on... Want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? Yeah, okay, I, I just shut the audio off. It's still on, you can see the little vibrations. It's actually not that loud when you're next to it, it's just the camera audio picking up on it is extremely loud for some reason. So it's been in there for about 10 minutes now, and obviously all the oil's been removed. It's actually removing the carbon okay. So it has removed portions of it. There are still sections though that doesn't look like it's done much. I'm gonna try rotating around every 10, 15 minutes and see what happens. So this is after the whole 55 minutes of it cleaning. You can see there are sections that are pretty much carbon free. However, there are large sections that still have fairly heavy carbon buildup on them. I'm not sure if you had maybe a larger parts cleaner, if you could put it in there for longer, if it would completely remove it. It did seem to break it loose. It was easier to get the carbon off of it, but overall, we still had to wire wheel it off, unfortunately. So this is now cleaned, and you can see our piston ring gaps. They're supposed to be about 120 degrees apart from each other, or else you can get high blow by initially. And of course, the piston's upside down, so there our oil control ring is on top. I always lubricate the wrist pin also while I have it like this. And we have our new upper rod bearing installed. Tab is in the tab. Now, some people think the tab holds it in. It does not, it's for alignment. The bearing's actually larger than the journal it's going in, and the crush is what holds it in place. Notice the one, that is a factory stamped one, which means this is cylinder number one. This one has the wrist pin hole. Now look what I'm using. Lucas Heavy Duty Oil Stabilizer. Now I haven't used this before as an assembly lubricant, but in my video, which was mostly critical of Lucas, I did say it probably would make an excellent assembly lubricant, but I don't recommend just pouring it in your engine oil by itself. Now, this stuff is extremely tacky. It is way more sticky than honey. Um, it will pull way apart and uh, it lubricates a lot. Now notice, these gloves look dirty. They're not, these are actually clean gloves. They do have some stains on them. Um, I generally recommend you using nitrile gloves. Don't use your bare hands when spreading this, but these are the gloves the company provides, so these are the ones I have to use. Notice there's not a bunch of dirt or anything flaking off from my gloves. They are clean, they just stain so they look dirty. And you're gonna wanna coat the entire bearing with this lubricant. This does not drip off like engine oil does, and it doesn't harden, which is nice, unlike grease. Now, this is what I did try using to install our piston rings at first. 5.7 inch bore, we did not have the correct piston ring installer, but let me tell you where this belongs. This is a universal piston ring installer. Right there, that's where that tool belongs! And anyway, don't worry, I did pull it out of the trash. It's not mine, it's company property, so. But I really hate that thing. Now, what am I doing here? Well, you wanna lubricate the piston liberally, as well as the cylinder bore. Now, in the past, I would just squirt it on the sides and then rub it around. I found if you use the rag, though, a lint-free rag, soak the rag in oil, or coat it in oil heavily, you'll do two things. It will help clean any dust, because remember, there's dust in the air no matter where you are. And it'll put a good, thin, uniform layer of oil on any component you're wiping down. It's a good idea. Uh, one of the first times I've tried doing that. So I'm gonna start doing that. I also, you're gonna wanna put more oil than that though between the rings and inside the rings. And there's not too much oil you can install in this process. The last thing you want is metal to metal contact damaging a component. So here I am applying a lot of oil 
to the ring area. Remember what I said, no amount of oil is too much in this particular process. Now notice this little line. I put a paint pen to correlate with the dowel side or with the tab side, sorry. Because when you're installing it, that needs to go towards the exhaust side. But once you start putting the piston down the cylinder bore, you don't know where the tab is anymore. Now notice this, this is the correct piston ring uh, compressor, that blue handle thing. Now I apologize for the angle here. Um, I only had one chance to record this. You can see I've got it there. And I should have picked a different angle, but this is the one I chose. I thought it would have a better shot. Now notice there, I didn't use a hammer or anything. I just slid it right into the bore. If everything's properly lubricated, you should be able to just slide it in my hand. You should not have to hammer these in. Now, it's in, the tab sides are facing the exhaust side, which is the piston ring cooling jet side. It's hard to see, but there's the bore up there. And we're putting our bolts in. These are the four bolt style ones, which are a pain compared to the two bolt style ones, just due to their amount of bolts. Now they torque to 52 foot pounds and then a 60 degree or one sixth of a turn, but torque specs are pretty boring. How about a little? So this week's destruction of the week, we have a C10 cat sitting on its flywheel housing. Notice the liner is out of number one and the liners are in and all the other ones. So what happened to this one? Well, somehow water got down the exhaust and it froze over the winter. Literally filled number one cylinder with water and then froze, which completely split, cracked this liner in half. Do you see that line? That one, now it's in focus. It runs the entire length of the liner. It literally split this liner in half. Now, initially they thought, okay, well, we'll need a new liner. We'll just do all the liners. However, all that force got to go somewhere. This is hard to see, but if you look real closely between the bolt hole and the liner bore, you won't, may, might not be able to see it, but there is a crack in the block here. So block is junk. Thought you might find it interesting. Thanks for watching.